You're listening to the Kingdom Flow Podcast. I'm Kyle Jones. And I'm Ian Sperry. Now more than ever, we're in a time where Christians need to rise up. Business owners and corporate executives have a great opportunity to capture hearts by living out their faith, holding the line that's being challenged every day. Listen in as we work to uncover ways to help you live your life by design and challenge the norm by breaking down barriers and truly encouraging you to go all in on your faith. Also, don't forget to leave a review and subscribe to the show on the platform of your choice. Let's go. Father, thank you for another beautiful day. Thank you, Lord, um, for all that you're doing in our lives, through our lives. And uh, Lord, just ultimately just thank you for for who you are. Um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for another opportunity to have a very special guest in the house. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Special guest indeed, Mia Robinson, youth pastor at Church of the King here in Katy. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, we can tell. We talked a little bit about it. She's got some nerves. I mean, our first couple episodes, we were having to work out the nerves a little bit. Look, the first couple episodes, him and I are by ourselves, and we're like, we're nervous. Like, I'm (laughs) sweating. (laughs) We're like, what are we? We're looking at each other. We're by ourselves with no cameras. And now I had to turn the AC down to 60 in my house just to get the beads out. But, you know, this, uh, we had identified you as a guest. A while back, yeah. and then we're just reminded of it when we just interviewed your dad, Pastor Jason Robinson. So for the folks who haven't heard that episode, go back and listen to it. It was a great episode. It was a great episode. Lots of wisdom, and he mentioned it on there, and, and Ian and I both looked at each other like, oh, yeah. Mia, yeah, that's right. you got to have Mia on the show. Yeah. And, and a lot of that has to do with just, man, what you're doing at, at the church and, and how obedient you're being just to allow God to move is just incredible. And, yeah. and people just, uh, people need to hear from you. Yeah. And, and they really do. I really believe that. And I think you're going to impact some folks and you're going to give some people, especially the parents coming. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, um, parents of youths yeah. coming in here, coming into the youth. So six, so f- when I say youth, what you um, are over is sixth grade, right? Sixth mm-hmm. grade is that through what you senior. Says? So I do um, sixth grade through 12th grade. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Uh, but we always like to start a little lighthearted. So okay. you're, since I'm actually glad you you said you haven't even listened to your dad's episode yet, which is actually good because he mentioned a story in there. I wanted to ask you about it, get your perspective. Oh, gosh. oh okay. so, I don't even remember. <laughs> Look, I get nervous too because he brings up stories. I'm like, what is he about to say? <laughs> so I'm say? now nervous for you, Mia, because I don't know. But I don't okay. remember the story. So what did he might, say? This could completely, uh, you know, just come to a screeching halt if you don't remember this. No, but, you're fine. Yeah, what if you didn't remember the story? <laughs> <laughs> so um, in in the episode though he shared this funny story when when Trent, oh, your yeah. older brother he yeah. uh, he was I don't he didn't say how old he was so I don't know if you remember this at all but he he said he was just really like in this place where he was really uh, on fire had this evangelical spirit about him uh, maybe when he was, uh, he was younger young. yeah and um, okay. and he said he had this realization dad. People are going to hell if we don't tell them this. People are going to hell. Mm. And he said, I got to go tell Mia. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't know, Mia's going to hell. I didn't know if Trent what... <laughs> was your conversion. I didn't know if he yeah. evangelized to you. So, I, he never told me. So story. is Trent the one, So Trent did not lead you to Trent the Lord. Trent did not lead me. <laughs> okay. Lord. So Trent. I love Trent. Trent is very extreme. Yeah. Whatever yeah. he feels, it's like 100%. That's so yeah. funny. But no, I, he never told me that. Okay, okay. That's I wasn't. Oh, sure. You'll have to ask gosh. your dad about that. Yeah. Because maybe maybe he, maybe that's when your dad would realize, like, I need to go. It's about probably about time to I, I share the gospel for me and make sure she's not going to hell. That's so I, I want to – is this – I'm trying to think back. Of, I think we're 31, 30, 30-something episodes in. Is she our first? She's the first. Well, aside from the wives. Aside from the wives. First solo female guest. Oh, wow. I am honored. Is this a first fruits moment? You know how we talk about first yes. fruits? What do we need? Did, wow. Ian, why don't you break out that Rolex you got? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I mean this is cool. I didn't. I didn't. I just. It just hit me. That's really cool. I'm glad that you're you're able to be our first solo female guest. So, yeah, tell us a little ahead. bit about. Um, so we heard from your dad. Um, I have a couple questions as we get a little bit deeper into it. But mm-hmm. tell us tell us a little bit about Mio. Um, a little bit of backstory where you're at. Um, 
where you're at now and and just what's kind of just give us a little bit about you that people that audience doesn't know okay. maybe to add to that flavor throw in a little you know what was it like being a pk okay yeah i can yeah. definitely yeah, yeah. do that yeah, yeah yeah so um i grew up in louisiana and uh yeah my dad was a youth pastor at a church there and um I was born in a part of every camp, retreat, Wednesday night you could possibly think of. He was a phenomenal youth pastor. Yep. I mean, world class. And um, I this is how I kind of explain it to movement is um, I feel like I almost didn't even grow up around church as much as I grew up around God. Wow. Like I grew up around the Precious. presence and yeah. power of yeah. God. Like I didn't, I didn't grow up like the the senior pastors and this stuff, it was great, but no, I experienced God. Mm -hmm. And it, that's something that you can't really take away from somebody. Yeah. When you experience it, it changes it. Um, but I grew up, and is it okay if I interlace like how I felt called the ministry with this? Because well, oh, it that kind of, that's where we were going today. Kind of, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I remember just being like, I want to do this. Like, I don't know how. And at the time, a female youth pastor was not heard of, I'd yeah. never seen it. And so I grew up thinking I want to marry a youth pastor because mm. I thought that was the only way I could get into student ministry. Mm. And so, um, but I remember whenever I was in Louisiana, we had this thing called a kids camp and it was for uh, younger kids. And I remember I went there and I was, I think I was 10 years old and I was in the middle of one of the services and I was like, I feel like God's calling me to ministry. Mm -hmm. I'm like eight or 10 years old wow. and I go home and I'm like, Mom, I think I'm called to ministry. And she was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I was like, I was like, Mom, I feel like I don't know. Like, I just, I feel God told me I'm going to be in ministry. And she was like, what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. Like, I'm 10 years old. I was like, yeah. Mom, I haven't figured that out yet. Like, but it, it was at a kid's camp. Wow. And so I do students, but I fully believe that God can speak to kids because that's, mm. that's where he first spoke to me. And then growing up, um, I, I knew it's what I wanted to do. And then uh, when I was 15, my parents uh, pulled us into the house and were like, hey, we're going to go plant a church in Texas. And at first I was really excited because it kind of felt like I was stepping into that. God's called me to do this. Like, I, I want to make a difference in this world. Um, I went to public school through fifth grade, and then my parents switched me to private school. In eighth grade, they were like, hey, we're about to put you back in this private school. And I was like, no, 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 I want to go to public school. And they were like, why? And I was like, I don't know. I just I need to make a difference with my life, and I don't feel mm. like it's going to happen here. So I was all into the like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to affect this world one way or another. Mm -hmm. wow. And so I switched schools. It was a hard year for me just because I went from public to private school or private school to public school. And um. But then we moved, and that was, like, world-shattering for me. Oh, like, wow. I didn't think it was going to be, and it was. So you were um, excited, but then it ended up being, It was not yeah. great. And mm. so um, I was going into my sophomore year of high school. I went from, at my private school, there was a class of 75 kids, and this one, there's, like, a 1,000. Yeah. So you can get lost in, like, <clears throat> one second. Um, lost my friends, lost my youth pastors, lost my church, lost my family. Um, my sisters did okay because they were in elementary school, but to move in high school is not fun. Yeah. It's just not fun. And so, um, it was really tough. And, um, the first thing I did when I moved here is, um, I was like, I got to find a youth group. Like, that's all I know about like what to latch on to. And I could not find one. Mm, I went wow. to every church in this entire area, and I could not find one. Or I found one. I can't remember where it was. But um, I was meeting everybody, and they were all homeschooled. And I was like, this is great. Great. Glad y'all got your thing. But I'm going to public school next week, and I need to find a friend that's <laughs> yeah. in this. Like, I yeah, need to find yeah. a friend. I'm glad y'all are homeschooled. Is there one person that goes to public school here? Because I'm I'm going into it next week, and I need somebody to, like, do this with. Yeah. And, um could not find one. Wow. Could not find one. And I was so frustrated with God. And I was like, I don't understand. Um, why would you send me here if there's nothing here? And then he just kind of answered like, Mia, that's why I sent you here. Mm. And so um, I knew that we were called to start a youth group from there. So uh, I was in the room where we started it, the little planning meeting. I was 15. Um, I just kept asking my dad as soon as we started the church, when are we starting this youth group? When are we starting it? When are we starting it? 
Um, I was not the primary person of it. There was a guy just kind of helping out for a while. Um, but it was cool because they, when they thought of names, I was the one who brought up movement mm. and they went with it, which wow. is so fun that like I got to be able to name it and then yeah. take it over in a few years. So, that's so awesome. yeah, that's kind of a little bit of an overview, but, and then I went really all, cool. I also went to Highlands college. Yeah. So, um, when I graduated high school, yeah. so I went to Cinco Ranch here one year and then I went to Katie for two. So I went to four schools in four years Wow. between, yeah, I went to a private, a public, and then one school here and another school here. So my high school was just kind of just make it through, <laughs> like, just, <laughs> just Look, survive. Me. Hey, I tell people all the time, if, if, if sports were not a thing for me, I don't know if I would have got through high school. Yeah. Really? I was just, I just wasn't a huge fan. I just, it, it, uh, school was not. Well, no, school is for everyone up until high school. But I mean, I don't. Yeah, I'm not saying that you should drop out of high school. No. What I'm saying is, it's you know, after it, I yeah, it oh. was it was a rough one for me too. Yeah, so. and so, um, but I still felt called to ministry, and those years were not fun. But I still knew, even if I felt far from God, I knew deep down, like I have a call. Like I know I'm called to do something. And so I went to Highlands College, uh, came home during 2020 just to surprise my family for spring break and then never went back. So I didn't have any of my clothes. I had like three days worth of clothes for all of COVID. Like it did was- Did you think you were gonna stay in Highland or did you think you were gonna stay in Alabama or were you all, were you were you wanting to come? So I had a job lined up in Oklahoma City. Oh. So I was gonna move like come August and go like work for a church in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I still, that's there in our family churches, absolutely love them. But um, during COVID, everything stopped. So yeah. it was like, I'm not moving anywhere. Like yeah, I'm not yeah, yeah. I'm not even leaving my house. And so uh, I started just kind of running the youth group from just like social media and little meetings here and there. And then we started meeting in person in like July and it just started growing. Wow. And so they were like, Mia, you're not going anywhere. Like yeah, you're, yeah. you're stuck. So that's kind of how I got here. So the plan was never for me to work here, like at Church that's, of the King. It was awesome. never in the plan for me my dad, any of us. And so, but just every other plan we had didn't work out. So I want to, I want to go back to a little bit part of your story. Cause I think a lot of people can learn from other people's struggles or adversity that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Um, go back to that place. Like w when you were kind of in between, um, as a, as a high schooler, like, what were you feeling? How, how did you stay steady through that process? Like, were you having, you know, we, a lot of us struggle with just identity issues in yeah. terms of yeah. our, like who we are. And, you know, sometimes we allow our work to define us or being a, a, a husband or a, a wife in some cases, like walk us through that. How did you stay steady? Just like through the moves through, and through, all that? Yeah. How did you, like, were you... It seemed like you were all in from the very beginning, but mm -hmm. like even in those times of adversity, like four schools in four years, is yeah. that what you said? Mm -hmm. Like that's insane. So there had to have been some grit about you in order to just kind of like you you had your eye mm -hmm. on advancing God's kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about wh wherever you want to go with that. What was that like? Um, it definitely felt a little bit when they say like when you're walking through the shadows in the valley of death, like it was just kind of it kind of just felt like I lost everything and mm. didn't even know where to start. Um, I would listen to worship music and I would just cry. Like it was mm. just a hard time. Like I was just like, I literally just lost everything. Wow. My friends, everything. And so, and then we're planning this church. So I know it's like for a good cause. Um, but then my parents are trying to raise money. So we have somewhere to live in the next six months. And so they're they're home, but they're not home a ton. They're going to meet with people because I mean they're trying to make sure we have a house, uh, like somewhere to live in six months. So yeah. it was like they're just trying to make it. I mean, when you're planning a church, it really is yeah, for the first level. two years. Yeah. You're yeah. just trying to make it. Yeah. You're just trying to survive. Yeah. Um, and then my brother got really sick, and um, it was scary for a couple months. And I think you just for me it was just. You just connect to God, whether you feel it or you don't, because sometimes we don't feel it. Sometimes when we're praying and listening to our Bible and we don't see it, we don't see a way out, and uh, you kind of just keep going. And one thing that my dad says that I really felt like was the testimony of my time. He was like, 
when you're walking through the shadow of the valley of death, keep walking. Mm. Just keep walking. Just keep walking. Don't sit down and like make a picnic there and be like, all right, well, this is my home now. No, you know, you just, you got to keep walking. And um, the good relationships I had, I latched onto them, but it was, it was nothing short of God. Yeah. I knew we were doing what we were supposed to do. And um, I would just connect to him. And sometimes it would not be like this beautiful, I'm reading my Bible and I feel the spirit. But it was like, there was points where it's like, I couldn't even get prayers out. Yeah. So I would literally listen to worship music. And I just knew he was here. Mm -hmm. And that's, and I didn't know anything but that. That's good. And that was hard. It's hard when you're like, there literally is no answer. God, I cannot make friends that love God for the life of me. Like when they say like, choose your friends and surround yourself with good people. I couldn't even find good people. Like it yeah. wasn't even, it wasn't choose. It was like, I, I can't find them. And so um, when I connected with God, it didn't always look pretty and perfect and like, oh, this wonderful hope moment. But he was with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I knew he was with me. And that's yeah. all I did know for a while. But was the, was the, was the breakthrough when when there was was that when you moved to to Alabama or was that part of the reason why you moved to Alabama was to kind of to f start fresh and I think there was little breakthroughs here and there yeah. and I think I held on to those breakthroughs with like everything I had mm -hmm. but um no I made some friends the church started doing well yeah one thing that was kind of difficult with starting the church is um you start with only one service. And so me and my sisters ran the kids' ministry in the back. So for the first six months of the church launch, we didn't see the church. We only did the kids' ministry. And, and at, at you're 15, your Ella was how old? She's like 10 and or 11. And is like seven? She's a part of it, yeah. She's a part and, of it. Seven-year-old leading 10-year-old. And, uh, right, right. and then like a few volunteers, and we're just going for it. Yeah. Like we're just trying. But yeah. um, no, I think there was little moments and um, I really just held on to those little moments. Yeah. But Alabama, for me, it was a fresh start that was really needed. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. really, really needed. But no, things got better and better. Um, I really liked Katie High School. I mm -hmm. really liked Katie. Honestly, I didn't like Cinco, but I think it's because I had a bad attitude. I think, yeah. I think, yeah. I Cinco's think, probably fine, I, yeah. Hey, yeah, I'm Cinco's a Cinco grad right, over here. Cinco grad, yeah. Are you Easy. really? Oh, I yeah. did not know that. That's part of the first is. wave. Isn't that crazy? Cinco's <laughs> really old. Yeah. No, I I'm just. 39. Mm. I think that the, I think I had friends and stuff and I was just mean because I didn't, I was like, I don't yeah. like this place. I want to move back. But Katie, Katie right. helped. Yeah. Um, I made some friends. And so I think it slowly got better. Yeah, but well, Alabama when I was, was a there. Start. I was I was part of the welcoming committee where we had to befriend new kids. So I'm maybe they disbanded that program. But if I was there, we we would have we would have made you <laughs> the feel welcoming better. welcoming committee. <laughs> I can relate to a, um, a portion of your story that I think it would be valuable for other other people. Um, when and I've shared this before on the podcast, but there was a moment where Lindsay was dealing with some health stuff as well. And it got it got pretty serious, and we didn't really have a ton of answers. And when I say serious, I mean this this process was three years or so, where it was just like waking up every day, not knowing what was going to take place, what kind of person and and attitude she was going to have, what I was gonna how I was going to respond. And the only thing that I knew to do was um, to to overcome that was to really get get myself into a position to hear worship music and mm -hmm. and just trying to create an atmosphere around me and i was the same way like i felt like i couldn't i couldn't even pray like mm -hmm. you know and i grew up you know similar I, I wasn't a pastor's kid but i grew up in the in the church my whole life and um and i just think that there's something that we cannot overlook in in how simple we can use certain things like worship music to create an atmosphere to really just give us a sense of peace and Absolutely. be in the presence of God. And I love that. I love that you had that similar experience because um, that's all I knew. And I would I would be literally in an office. Some days it would bring me into tears. Some days it wouldn't. But for almost every day, um, for you know, pretty much the whole time I was working with this company, that's that's how I made it through. Yeah, that's how I made it through. 
I I share some similar story when I was dealing, like I talked about on the podcast, with my mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Same thing. I, I never really tied them together, but and this is not necessarily where the podcast is going. But it th- when when worship music got on, it it just soothed my soul. Like it was just this. It was what when I like you when I didn't me when I didn't know how to pray. And I didn't, my wife didn't know how to pray. And like Lindsay, she didn't know, she's prayed all the prayers and you've prayed all the prayers for her. And you yeah. like, you don't know what else to do. I wouldn't, I don't know, you know, again, while we're on this subject, but I would encourage listeners to just get in, just worship. Yeah. And yeah. there's, there's a, there's something that happens uh, when we begin to worship and when we begin to just sit in the presence and do nothing else but sit, um, that, that change really do begin to fall, and and, and more than that too. You, there's just a peace that comes over um, that that's hard to explain, but it does what you said it did. It, it gets you through. It's almost like putting enough gasoline in the tank, yeah, yeah. just to get you to the next stop. Absolutely. And and sometimes in our lives, you know, it's like we can't look toward the end of the road. We just got to yeah. look to the next stop. Yeah, and and so it sounds like that's what you kind of did. Like, hey, these 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 moments of of worship um, were able to just help you get to that next stop, and 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 then again, and then again, and eventually, there's enough gas in the tank where you can begin to go. I again. would add too, when you do overcome that adversity, though, don't lose sight of that. Yeah, like, I, look, keep I'm it talking going. to myself. Keep, no, I'm just saying, keep yeah, keeping the worship for sure. going. You know, our whole life has to be an act of worship from there. So, you know, even if you aren't going through struggles or adversity, no. I think there's a lesson in that that we all can can learn from. And and I know you do this, and we we try to do it too. Where we're just, no matter the day, we're constantly yeah, trying to play worship music. And there's just it's it's something so simple that mm-hmm. I think people just just miss. But so we were both talking before you came in, and and. Um, and it's relevant. You already mentioned a little bit about you being called. Um, you know, it's funny. You went to Highlands. What really kickstarted this whole conversation between us? We were at Highlands College as well pops, for man. a recent event at the art conference. Mm-hmm. Um, and man, he really challenged everybody in that room to truly understand whether or not they were called to the point where he was going through and and defining it out basically in this point where hey if you can't remember the defining moment in your life when when you were called or when you heard that you were called maybe you weren't there's a good chance you weren't called there's a good chance you weren't called yeah and um and then so you know we've had some conversations since then even as of as of late of this week um, I'm reading through and where Samuel is being called, where God's calling Samuel, and it, it took him three times before he actually recognized his voice. I'm in the same, I'm in the same. Hey. Yeah, and we're in the same book. Hey, Didn't even we're know in that. the flow, man. Yeah, we didn't yeah, know that. That's good. So, Mia, don't worry about us. Just, uh, <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> but, um, and I'm just like, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here on this chapter, and I'm reading it. I've, I've read it multiple times already, and I'm just just really trying to soak it in because I, I want to understand it and I want to dissect it. But take us back to that moment, like when you were called, you know, and, and what, what Chris Hodges, what he said was there was actually two times. It wasn't there I was, was about one to ask time. you if there was a second yeah. time. So called early, and then obviously there was a reigniting exactly. or a second call mm-hmm. that that pushed you and propelled you forward yeah. Um, yeah. to what was next. So, yeah, take us back to that moment, and then if there was a second calling in there, too. Yeah, so, um, no, I remember when I was a kid. Um, I mean, I, I, it was a while ago, So, but I, I just, I'll never forget it. I just remember being in the little room. Um, it was at Camp Living Waters. I don't know if you've uh, ever been there. <laughs> yes, no. my God. Look. I can't believe they still have that place. Right? <laughs> it's, so, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is a, look, <sighs> look, some monumental moments happen on that That's campground. Right. Um, no, it's true. Wow. But, yeah. uh, no, and I just remember being in there and just being like, I just heard it clearly. And then I remember they were doing, like, testimonies of the week. And, I mean, it's kids, so, you know, sure. you never – you never fully know what, what they're going to say, say. And so they were like, does anybody have anything? And I was like, oh, I do. And they were like, what? Like, they're just trying to make it fun and engaging so kids are even paying attention. Yeah. And I was like, 
And I just went up and said on the mic, well, I don't, I don't really know what this means, but I feel like God's called me to ministry. Wow. And it was just, it just, that's where it started. And I remember asking my dad a couple years ago, not when uh, I was younger, I was like, did you know that like, could you see that for my life? And he was like, Mia, I knew so early on. Mm. Yeah. He was like, I could tell, but he never told me. He yeah. let mm. me find out. Yeah. And so um, like, he never was like, he would always tell me I was a leader. He wouldn't tell me like, Mia, I think you're called to be a pastor. Cause I think he he wanted me to figure that out for yeah. myself. Mm-hmm. And that was something um, Mark Pettis, who's the president of Highlands College was, he would always say that he has one son that he was like, hey, I never tell him he's like called the ministry, but I always tell him, hey dude, you're a leader. And so my dad would just tell me that kind of stuff. Um, but I got to the point where it's like, I think it's ministry. And then we had this camp called um, Revolution Camp. Hmm. And you grew up going to those. And so, um, yes, I did. And it just, Lord, it was something. But it got, uh, it was. Was it, it a flag tossing camp? No. That, no. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Like the AG style. Oh, like, no, what do you no, think? No, no, no. 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 I don't even know how to describe it. It's special. Um, <laughs> it was a great, you know, it was a phenomenal it was, it was camp. powerful. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It was powerful. So it was a camp that uh, my dad started a long time ago, and then other churches started jumping mm-hmm. oh, onto it. So yeah. it grew and grew yeah. and grew. But I remember one night they just had, and they usually would do this once a year, um, and they were like, this night is for anybody who just feels called to ministry. Wow. And I just, I never didn't think it was me. Like, if that makes sense. I yeah. always yeah. was like. How old were you in that moment? I mean, I was, I was maybe in junior high and high school. Yeah. Wow. Like, I, I just, 13, 14, 15, I just knew it. And even we would go back to Rev Camp whenever we moved here. And whenever we'd go back, I still knew it then. Even though I was in like the hardest time of my life, um, I still knew there was a call there. But yeah, there was multiple, like I always thought, God's talking to me right now. Yeah. God is talking to me right now. And so yeah, yeah there was multiple though. That's like, so good. I think um we've talked about this before. We we always say that because we talk about a lot of things again and we kind of expand deeper, but like I, I think people, a lot of people, because I, I can say this because I was one, they just kind of dismiss some of these dreams and visions that just kind of come out of nowhere mm-hmm. and they chalk them up to like nothing. Whereas what we've come to learn is a lot of times that is a a, 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 a desire or something that God is placing on your heart, a dream that is God given. Absolutely. And could even go as far as saying that's a calling. Mm-hmm. And what we've been discussing is we can... When we say called, it's not just for ministers and and, and pastors. It's we're we're called in different places, and, and and we talked about how God has equipped us with different skills and everything else. And that's a big part of like why we wanted to do this podcast is because we're not pastors. We're just a couple of guys trying to figure this out, and we also own some businesses as well. But um, how do you walk the youth? the youths, I should say, through that process? Like, how do you teach people how to hear from God at that age? Because that's, I'll be honest, that's not something that my youth director really expanded on is he didn't, he taught the word, he's a great guy, very creative and engaging, but he wasn't teaching how we could hear from God. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Um, No, because it's important that it's you hear from, because it's great if I hear from God and teach the students, but I want them to hear. Um, and I don't think it's I don't think it's complicated. I think it's just teaching them how to listen yeah. and that they're not wrong. Because a lot of times, and this is what I tell students often, um, they're like, "Oh, I've never heard God before," and I say, "Yes, you have. You just didn't know it was God." Yeah. Um, I said, "Have you ever felt like you were in a situation or you had a friend and you just felt I need to get out of this?" I need to not be friends with this person. You're at a party. I need to leave right now. They're like, yeah, I felt that before. So that was God. Mm. That's not your good conscience. No, no, that was the Holy Spirit guiding you. Yeah. And then um, I think it's just telling them that you have heard God and then affirming you're doing it right. Because a lot of times we hear like when we are listening for God, like the first voice we hear is God. 
And then the second we hear is us second our guess and ourself. And then the third is the devil telling us that didn't just happen. Yeah. And so a lot of times it's just having them practically try and then affirming them, no, 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 you did it right. You're, you're on track. You're doing well. Um, and then just not making hearing God's voice so complicated. Yeah. Because sometimes it's not. Sometimes yeah. it's, hey, you're, you're all right. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say probably most of the time it's not complicated. Right. You know, he's he's it's 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 really it's really cool to see um how he he speaks to us all individually, but yet and uniquely, but yet it's 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 pretty simple. Um and what I can say from just the outsider, so my kids are too young um right now, but I know yours is in the youth. I can say that the the um the the kids and the young really young adults in in our community are starting, they're really hearing the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, touch a little bit on the youth right now. So like, I know people don't like to brag about numbers and this and that, but it sets the context for the listeners of what really is happening here in KD um, with our youth group, uh, with the young adults ministry, um, with just just this, this generation that a lot of that the world, in a sense, has has just chalked up to be the lost ones, right? Just, yeah. It's just there. We can't we can't deal with these people. We have two other we have too many big problems right now to deal with. Um, so talk a little bit about the youth. Like, hey, what are the, what what's the youth numbers right now? Um, and and a little bit about what um, what they're what, what y'all are doing in in the ministry itself. Yeah. yeah. What's so, different about it? Yeah. Got it. So I think uh, we average around 250 to 300 right now every week. Um, It is so much fun, and I absolutely love it. Uh, I've been the youth pastor for three years. So uh, I just hit three years. And then my husband, Hunter, runs the young adult ministry, and he does not work for the church at all. He has a full-time job in, um, like, construction, all that kind of stuff, and then runs it fully on, this is what I feel called to do. So when you say, like, a calling is not, like, a ministry job, like, I could not agree and champion that more. Yeah. Because um, whenever he first came on, uh, he was working for the church and just kind of felt like, I feel like this is not fully what I'm supposed to do. But when you're in ministry school, they tell you, like, 90% don't make it. And this yeah, is this. Yeah. So you feel like a failure if you're not in ministry till you die. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, oh yeah. my gosh. And um, and so, but with that, he was like, I don't know. Like, and my dad did a great job of like, Hunter, just try it. Just yeah. go, try it. No, nothing's gonna hurt. You're not disappointing God by like kind of the verse that says like let a hand not try to be a foot because we need every part of the body. Sure. Yeah. Not everybody's supposed to be in ministry. Right. And a calling I don't think is a ministry job. I don't think a calling's a job. I don't yeah. think it's what brings a paycheck in every week. So I am 100% like, yeah. and he's doing a phenomenal job. But yeah, we range around um, 250 to 300 students um, weekly. Uh, and then for the young adults... We just started it, so we're kind it's of incredible. fifty to seventy, I would say. Um, yeah. Which Hunter's doing a great job. Oh, which young adults is like, you can't even find a young adult ministry here yes. in Katy. You Spring cannot. Katie. Yeah. You literally can't, and that's kind of wasn't you can. There's a few in. It's more like a small group, though. It's kind of I've I've looked a little bit into it. It's more just like a, uh, I I wouldn't. It's more like a round table, a small group, you know, younger group kind of getting together, but. You know, you guys, what y'all have going over there is, I mean, y'all, how many months? Like maybe three max. It, it's unbelievable. Like, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So the, the the question from that, though, yeah, we see the numbers. So like what 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 is besides truly submitting it to God mm-hmm. and, and drawing people in, What where's what's creative about it? Obviously, there is people want to show up. There yeah. is something different that's happening. What are you like? On the practical side, what are you doing on a regular basis to to continue that? To cultivate that, yeah. I think, um, so one thing is I'm youth pastoring Gen Z, but I also am Gen Z. Yeah. Mm. So um, I know their life. Uh, I know how they think. I know how they feel. Um, So with that, I talk to them about what they need to hear in the form of we can do a deep dive of 
the book of Acts, and that is great. But a student is wondering, hey, I'm a teenage girl, and I need you to tell me why I shouldn't sleep with my boyfriend tonight because he tells me he's going to break up with me if I'm not. Mm, or a yeah. guy is looking at stuff he's not supposed to be looking at. Or how do I deal with friendships? And so what I think we do is we take the Bible – and we put it in, what are they going through? What do they need guidance with right now? Mm. Like, let me, I want you to leave and feel like, I know what to do now. Mm. I know what to do. And so our whole vision is um, experience God and equip students for now and the future. So we want them to first experience God, mm. but we want them to know what to do. Because yeah. um, it's we are completely useless if they feel like, oh, wow, Mia is so smart about the Bible. But then they go to college and they're done. They're, re- yeah. I mean, they drop off. And so we talk about um, what their life right now, and the number one thing we do is we get them to pick out a scripture, put it on a note card, read it every single day. So I th- say the number one thing we're doing is we are putting the truth of God's word in their hearts every single week and every single day. And not just saying a scripture, but I mean, the amount of times we've printed off, passed out, said this over. We did. I did a sermon where it was um, a truth chair and a feelings chair, mm. and you got to pick which one. Yeah. And the truth is not your truth, it's the Bible, because the Bible is the only truth. And so I think with students, though, they, they need, they want the truth. They want the truth. Yeah. And so I think we're we're giving them the actual truth. Because, I mean, they one thing that's very different is they have access to the Internet, Google, all mm-hmm. this from, like, a very young age. Yeah. I did, too. And so with that, um, you just hear a lot, and you don't know what's true. You don't mm. know what's fake. <laughs> um, and I think what sparked a lot of that was with COVID – well, with COVID, they told us that 250,000 people were going to die in our city this week. Everyone is freaking out. Yeah. And then that didn't happen. So wait, are you lying to me? And so it's kind of like they start looking for, well, that's not true. Well, this is not true. Well, what is true? Yeah. And so I think when we're showing this is Jesus is the way, the truth, not a truth. He is the truth. And then we take things that are in their life. What is going on in your life right now? What do you need guidance with right now? And so I think between those two things, um, they're they're coming in and they're feeling like she's talking to me. Like she knows what I'm going through. And then they leave ready. Yeah, They leave ready for whatever the world's about to bring to them. So, good. so I hope that answers no, it. No, that's but, a great question. Okay. I mean, a great answer. That's so good. What do you think is – do you think Gen Z – is that the hardest thing that's plaguing the Gen Z generation right now? Is 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 it just finding the truth? Like, is you know what I'm saying? Like, is is what 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 is that Gen Z group? So our, our average or our most common demographic for um, our listeners is between 35, 35 and forty one ish. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we have a we have a quite a few that are going to be you know either preteens or teens. Um, what is the biggest thing? plaguing or or what it, what's the thing that's holding that Gen Z back what, or that they're struggling with right now? I just think that um, there's almost too many options that mm-hmm. the world's giving them mm-hmm. to the point where they're confused out their mind and they need direction. Yeah. They need direction. They're craving direction. They're craving it from their parents mainly. Um, just kind of like – you you can say whatever you want. You can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. You can love whoever you want. And it's very like you're trying to shape your own identity at 11 and you have a million options. And it's confusing and you feel lost. And so I think um, one thing is they they want a clear path. What is right? What is wrong? Yeah. And like I, I'm work a parent – needs to make that for them. And I feel like so many, me and my dad talk a lot about this. I feel like a lot of parents are nervous because they don't want to offend them or hurt them. But you don't understand, they, parents, they're looking at you for what is right, what is wrong, what do I do, what do I not do? They need your help. They need your help. And if they disagree with you, if your students disagree with you, like, let them disagree. Like, you're shaping the world for them. And I feel like so many Parents are nervous to do that because they don't want to like, 
hurt their feelings or if, is this right to say? And um, the only reason I feel okay to say this is because me and my dad talk a ton. And then we had, uh, were y'all there when Dr. White spoke a few? Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the number one influence in a student's life is going to be their parents. Yeah, It's going to be their parents. And so I think the thing that's kind of hurting them is uh, everyone's telling them, oh, it's whatever you want. And no one's telling them, no, that's not a good idea. You don't need to do that. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. 100%. And does. so when, when you, but when you're 10 and the world's telling you just do whatever you want, you're so lost out yeah. of your mind. You're yeah. like, I don't know what to do. I need someone to tell me what to do. And so. Um, well, I hear it from Lindsay's perspective, being a principal in the schools mm -hmm. and seeing at the elementary age. And it is, it is starting way too early where these kindergarten and first graders have way too much freedom, way more yes. freedom than they than they should have to the point where they also can dictate the decisions that they get to do as a family, what they, you know, all these other things. And what it comes down to that I can see is that parents just don't care enough. So there's there's an intentionality that's missing. But then like for somebody maybe in a place where their kids are older now and now they like they started off and they live this way, but they want to change. Well, they it's hard for them to change that approach and, mm -hmm. and put structure in place because now they've they they have befriended their child versus been their parent. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I hear it when you say that. And I think it's uh it's totally true with where we are in today's world. And and it's and it and it's as simple as starting with a device, like too much too much Roblox, too much Minecraft, yeah. whatever it is at the early age, which leads to, hey, now I get to have my phone in my bedroom whenever I want. I have the access to the world, whatever. There is a rule and policy in our house. There's absolutely zero phones upstairs, like no phones upstairs at all. And the reason why we do that is not to um, limit our kids from yeah. You know, having the freedom upstairs and just like being able to talk, even if they want to talk on their phone, they, they've got to come downstairs. Like even if they want to play Absolutely. Roblox, they got to come downstairs and play it. And just even having that expectation and setting some boundaries and, and fencing it in, now it creates a space so that when they, as they get older and, and we do give more freedom to the older kids as they move forward, well, there's still structure around the freedom mm -hmm. within that. But if they're just if they get to do whatever they have, whenever they want all all the time, when you start to try to parent them or they get in trouble, like they're not going to listen to you. No. And and there's issues with that. So I have a scenario for you that I want you to try to answer. Okay. Okay. I'm a 30, 39 year old, forty year old dad. I have a fourteen year old son that doesn't want anything to do with church. Doesn't want to be involved in church. Um, or I have a 14 year old that, you know, knows about church, but is just living, you know, whatever. Um, what do, what do I do? What do I do to get my son or daughter into church and plugged in? How do I reach the Gen Z generation without pushing them so far away that they never want to, they never want to come back? I don't. I don't think it hurts to say, son, if you live in my house, we're going to church. Mm. I don't think it hurts. And um, even if they're frustrated with you, I mean, you make the rules. Like, it's yeah. you, you're paying for the kid to live there. Like, um, you never know what God can do once they get in that building, though. Yeah. And it seems it's a simple I, – I, I think I thought you were going to say that, and it's a simple answer. But like you were saying before, we allow our children to dictate what we are, that yeah. a lot of a lot of parents that we – you know, that they're, they're in this situation, and they just won't say, hey, Bubba, you're going to church. You're coming. Yeah. You're coming. Yeah. I remember your dad used to always – I think it was your dad. No, it was Pastor Steve Robinson. He would say – my mom would say, if you don't go to church, you don't get lunch money. <laughs> Well, now that's child abuse, so you can't do that. <laughs> but but that's what he used. That's how his mom. Hey, like you said, I'm under my roof. You're going to go to church. So I would encourage the listeners that do have that child, um, that hey, first they have to be the example, mm -hmm. right? First you've got to go to church, right? You've got to, you've got to step forward and you've got to be you know putting your butt in the seat and and doing what you're supposed to be doing, and um, as they see the example, 
pushing them and going, hey, you're going to go, um, I think makes a – I remember my mom did that for me. Yeah. When I was a wayward, wayward teen, and um, and I I couldn't stand it at the being at, at, in the in the moment, but I could not be more grateful now yeah. that that she yeah. forced me to be in the house, that she forced me, and look that you know it wasn't fun, but down the line or now I can thank her for what you know for drawing that line. So one thing we've learned and tried to institute is taking the easy wins, like the easy yeses. So if we're going to enforce certain aspects like that, like church, I mean, we that's not really something that is, is really any question, frankly, yeah. in our house anymore, or yeah. it ever was, yeah. because our kids grew up in that environment. But is, is not having such a lockdown on them, but mm -hmm. if there's something they want to do, it's the reason why my boys have the haircuts they have, because they wanted to have that type of haircut, and it was like, man, it's just hair, sure. We'll, we'll cut it. And it's kind of like this mohawk looking thing and, and, rat uh, tail. and, and rat tail. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I will shout out to Steve Weatherford because they there saw, go, Steve. they saw his it's hair your fault, buddy. <laughs> and it's they funny. said, I want his haircut, both of them. And we got it. And now they, they bleach it even. But, um, Good and Lord. then same thing with Kennedy, like it, she was, she doesn't do it as much anymore, but she just wanted blue hair one summer. And it was like, sure, you can have blue hair. It was yeah. just like those little things. And, and and if we can if we can give them the some freedom still within the structure, mm -hmm. I think that goes a long way. So now that when something bigger does come along, like hey, we're gonna go to church every Sunday, or even something outside of that sure. that we're not mentioning, now you have that ability to 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 do that, and Absolutely. they don't get so mad at you and hate you and think that you never let them do anything mm -hmm. if you just take the easy yeses. Absolutely, yeah. that's good. So where we talked about a little bit where where. Where you were from, where the church is now, where where is the youth? Where is the youth going? What do we? What is what is COTK um, in Texas have or Katie have in store for for where we're going with the youth? Um, kind of some of the I don't know the dreams or the the vision that you have for the future. Absolutely. So um, how we kind of grew was pretty quick. Um, we doubled basically twice, and so we would average around seventy students moved into the building uh, 140, 150. And then a few months later, we started averaging between 250 and 300. Um, and with all that, uh, I sat down with my dad at the beginning of this year and I said, what, what do you want for our students? Um, Cause that was kind of something I learned from a youth pastor friend of mine. And he was, he's much older than me and is like, your your vision is your senior pastor's vision. Mm -hmm. You don't depart from it. And so I sat down with him and I said, what do you want for the students of movement? And so he said, I want their relationship to grow deep with God. I want us to go deeper. So not necessarily bigger, more, everybody, that's but good. deeper. And I really feel like that's where we're at as a church, church. Yeah. as a whole. That's so right. It's like we're going to pause. Because, I mean, the world – or the world's – kind of success with growth and stuff is just like more, more, more. You get it, maintain it more. You get it, maintain it more. And so um, when he said pause, I was kind of like, what are we doing? Like, isn't yeah. it? And so it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to pause. Um, and so what we're doing is we're growing deeper and deeper and deeper with relationships with them. And so in teaching them how to have a relationship with God, one thing I'm really excited about is we just launched an internship called 252. Uh, the only verse in the Bible that talks about Jesus's teenage years was Luke 252. Mm -hmm. And Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. And um, it's for students going into 10th grade through graduated seniors. And we were planning for like 15 of them to sign up. And we had 35 sign up, and wow. we had to close it off because uh, we were like, I'm sorry, we literally can't handle any more of you guys. Yeah. Which you don't think 35 teenagers uh, is a lot, but it's it's a lot. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. Um, what we do is uh, we have them Mondays, Thursdays, and we have them from 10 to 4, and we do devotionals. We go over the Bible Project, which I'm not sure if y'all have ever heard of that. They get an overview of the whole Bible they're serving the church. They're learning about the ministries. So we're just taking many ways. We're doing our first mission trip that Kennedy's going on yeah. with me. I'm really excited about. So, cool. so um, we're going deep right now. And so that's the goal. And I think 
our next big step is not as far as we think Mm -hmm. for not just this youth ministry, but the whole church. But for right now, we're going to grow deep. And from that, we're we're going to go into a whole nother level of a church. But I don't think that's just for students. I no. think we're at I think students are right on track with where the church is at. I think we're all in the spot where we're growing deep and then we're going to take a next step soon. So so, so expand on that cuz what we 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 talked a little bit about it with your dad but I wanted your perspective on like some of these revivals that are happening too. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. Like, where's that stemming from, in your opinion? What are you seeing as a Gen Z? I just think, kind of what I was saying, I just think they're hungry for it. Yeah. And they found the truth, and now they want everybody to know. And uh, have you all seen the movie The Jesus Revolution? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't yet. seen it yet. Can it I really? I told a bunch but, of people, or people, yeah. a bunch of people said, you got to see it, yeah. you got to see it. I haven't seen it. It so parallels with this generation. Really? Wow. Yes. In different ways. Sure. But, um, like in the 70s, it was all like it was a drug movement and it was all and literally they say this in the movie and Dr. White quoted it. They were looking for truth. They were just looking for it in all the wrong places. But once they found it, they told everybody because they found yeah. it. Mm-hmm. They found it. Mm-hmm. It's a phenomenal movie. We showed it at Movement last week. And really? just because it was so like this, they you could totally watch it and be like, oh, my gosh, this is this generation just kind of looking for God, but they don't know that they're looking for God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so they're looking for God, but in all the wrong places. But once they found him, it's just, and then also, this is sad, but we're the, Gen Z is the first post-Christian generation. And so what that means is like, back in the day, every generation was like, majority are Christians, your apple pie America, going to church on Sundays, that's over. That's over. Yeah. And that's not fun. But now when you have a relationship and an encounter with God, it's not a rippled effect. It's a first experience. Yeah. And a lot of our students are the only Christians in their family. Mm-hmm. And they bring their parents to wow. church. Like a lot of them. If you ask how many of our students attend our church on Sunday, I doubt half of them do. Wow. And wow. so, yeah, that's, it's, they're looking for it. And when they find it, they, it's like, it's, I don't know, it's like finding the cure to a disease that yeah. everybody around you is suffering from. And yeah. so they're, they're on fire about it. But I think it's, they're the post gener they're the post Christian generation. And so, yeah, I hope that answers that. But oh, that's um, great. That was a better answer than I expected. <laughs> it was great. I mean, that was just, it's almost like this generation is redrawing the line in the sand. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's almost, you know, it's, it's, Absolutely. it's like they're the, they're again the front runners mm-hmm. of the next move, the next revival for God, and, yes. and the next uh, outpouring of His Spirit on this on this country is really starting with that Gen C generation. Mm-hmm. Um, that really was either my fam or my parents or my parents' parents that did it for for us, mm-hmm. um, and so um, and parents need to pay attention. Yeah, they do. Parents need to pay yeah. close attention. They do. I mean, that is a. Um, it's, I've never seen it, Mia, from that point of view before. I didn't know that we were – I knew I knew it was messy, but I didn't realize we were the, this was the first group that it's like – and it makes sense. It's no longer the, the country club feeling of, you know, hey, even though the home in itself is a wreck – we still go to church and we still, you know, have blueberry pie on Sunday. Yeah, it, that's 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 not it. And we're all the whole family's Christians, right? I mean, that was yeah, we'll that check was the Christian box. That was our that yeah. was me. You know, that was our our. And really, if I'm looking at my life, that was starting to fade even with my age. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were my generation was starting to look. We're in that weird place, but um, that's really really good. It's opened up my eyes even in this conversation for my seven year old who's coming into that. Um, it's so much more important um, now than ever with with this generation with with these kids that it's the truth is in front of them and it's not it's no it's not a question yeah. and we do a pretty good job of that in our house but it, it's made me go I've got to I've got to make so I got to make sure the truth is so evident yeah because the the rest of the world is 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 so all over the place mm-hmm. that. Um, there's no when he when he gets to that next stage. There's no question of, of of what the truth is, um, 
So that's really, really good. Absolutely. That's really Thanks for good. sharing that. And yeah. they, they crave boundaries. Yeah. They crave they do. boundaries. And it's crazy because you wouldn't think that. They may kick and yell and scream, but I'm telling Internally, you, they want it. When, when they close that door, and in a few years, that they're so thankful for that. They, I mean, and freedom does not necessarily mean no boundaries. Mm-hmm, that's right. not freedom. That's recklessness. Yeah. And so, um, you know, they crave boundaries. And it's kind of been weird for me as a youth pastor. I have no kids. And so a lot of times I was super intimidated by parents because it's like I was ready for them to be like, what do you know? And I'm like, nothing. I don't know anything. I don't <laughs> know. A child. I don't know. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. But instead, I've had so many parents come up to me and be like, I need your help. Mm. And I was so, so like, felt like I really, this sounds ter- terrible, but like, I felt like I had nothing to offer because mm-hmm. I'm not a mom. I don't know. But I do know this generation because I am it. Mm-hmm. And so. Um, I think opposite me. I think you're like yeah. in such a unique spot to be able to speak to parents and speak to kids because of your age and because you don't have kids. Um, I, I see it the exact like God is using that to speak so deeply in the in the students' hearts, and in, in really parent. I know multiple parents. I mean, we're we're in different circles that say, you know, w- they may not tell you this, but they're telling their, their the men in the in the circle how much movement is not only meant for their child, but it's for their whole family. Mm-hmm. And so, like what y'all are doing, like you said, in the in the youth is really it's the opposite of what it used to be. The dad, then the mom, then the kids. Now it's it's the kids, the mom, and then the dad. And yeah. and and we're seeing it in these circles and the dads are going, This is this is crazy, right? Yeah. This is this is unbelievable. And so I just want to speak to you directly because of I do have a daughter and the youth and you have just embraced her, embraced that relationship and you didn't have to. Um and I just thank you for that, and I honor you for that because that is going to be extremely impactful for all of for for my family and 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 really what I desire in carrying out my legacy in creating this this just this environment where people know the truth and we hold the standard. Mm-hmm. And how do we do that? How do we live like that? And how do we walk that out? And I commend you for just pouring into her specifically for that. And I'm excited for the continued relationship that you guys are going to have. And I just also want to speak a word of encouragement over you because just even sitting here listening to you talk, you have an incredible spirit of wisdom on you. Yeah, and far beyond your years. It's That's exactly the words right out of my mouth, yeah. far beyond your years, that when you walk into certain rooms, you, you need to carry that confidence with you because yeah. you could walk into any room, no matter the age of the, the, the people, the parents, the men, the women, whatever, and bless them just by your, your presence. And, and, and I just think, um, I just wanted to say that and I, I wanted to encourage you with that. So. Thank you. And yeah. I love your daughter. Thank She's you. She's great. I love Kennedy. <laughs> she is. That's She's awesome. awesome. So, well, I think that is a beautiful way to end it. Yeah. Um, can, would you do us the honor of leading us in prayer to close? Absolutely. All right. So, Thanks, pray. God, we thank you so much for first um, just everything you've done for us. Thank you that we're we're here, God, and that um, we have a relationship with you, and that we love you, God. I pray for every uh, student, every parent, Lord God, that your presence is with them, Lord. I pray for any parent that is listening to this that has a teenager, or their their students are coming up to their teenage years, Lord God, and they're just intimidated. God, I pray, Lord, that your presence comes upon them and you give them the confidence that they're going to know what to do, God, yeah. that they can do this. They can raise godly teenagers, God. It is not impossible. And even in the times where they have pushed back with their teenagers and it feels like this is never going to work out, Lord God, that you're speaking to that teenager even when they don't know it, God. Mm, If they're having that teenager that does not want to walk into the church doors, Lord God, that you're speaking to that kid whether they know it or not, Lord God, Mm, and that you're not giving up on them, God, that you love their students and their kids more than they love them, God. We are thankful for that. God, I pray that you fill every person in listening to this with your power, God, yes, with your Lord. confidence. Yeah. God, I pray that you give them peace, Lord, beyond their understanding that you got this. Yeah. God, you've taken care of me. You'll take care of them, God. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.
Thanks for listening. We hope that you feel encouraged by today's episode. Help us reach the masses by leaving a review and subscribing to the show. We'll see you next time. 